Okay. Great. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I hope everybody is doing well. Um, make sure everybody can see presentation here. I think my computer thinks it's Friday or Monday because it's kind of going slow. So bear with me. Can you all see the the PowerPoint? Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, this is our Green Spot uh, Conversations webinar series. Uh, the, the conversations were started by our Green Spot Advisory Board, and they're really a way to dive into some topics of sustainability and to give more of an overview. So we have 45 minutes, and it's really to uh, kind of wet your beak on uh, a topic and then give you information on where you can find out uh, more uh, resources or more information about that topic. So. I appreciate y'all being here. Uh, if you are not a GreenSpot member, you could join by going to uh, columbusgreenspot.org. And uh, with sustainability, the city sees sustainability as kind of three pillars moving in the same direction. When you have environment, economy, and people or equity all moving forward, that's when you have sustainability. And really, that's when we thrive as a community. So that's what our goal is, our goal is no matter what we do here in the environmental world. With GreenSpot, so our tagline is we inspire, educate, and recognize households, businesses, community groups, and neighborhoods that adopt sustainable practices. And uh, we provide them a framework to think about sustainability and, and actions that they can take to make a difference. And also to track what, what they're doing to make a difference through the My GreenSpot app. So uh, I won't read the numbers there, but you can kind of see uh, our membership. It is free to join, free to be a member, and there are benefits of, of being a member. These are our collective savings in our Green Spot universe, we like to say. These are, you know, these are probably underreported because not every one of our members is logging every single thing that they're doing. But you can see when, you know, one person does something that really can inspire others. And when you have 20,000 people doing something, uh, it does add up those savings on water, energy, uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, et cetera. So uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. And we will jump into today's topic. You just have to give me a second. Like I said, my computer's going a little bit slow today. If you're like me, you're looking outside and wondering what a gorgeous day this is. You know, I wish I could take my computer outside and uh, do this out there. But instead, it's just, I'm in my office with a blurry background. But that's okay. So um, today we have a, a great conversation about our find feathered friends and your backyard. And as winter is approaching, although today it's, you know, it feels more like fall than winter, but we know winter will be here soon. Uh, it gives us a unique opportunity to attract birds to our backyard. Uh, but what food to put out, what type of feeder to have, uh, we have the answers today for those. And any, any questions you might have, you can either type them in, in the chat or if you're viewing on Facebook, you can uh, put it on, uh, comment on that and we'll get to that as well. So I want to introduce our three speakers. We have Allison Clark, who is the manager of public programming at the Grange Insurance Audubon Center. She joined the center in early 2010 as a part-time educator, overseeing scout programs and birthday parties before moving into a full-time educator role. She also teaches for the center's conservation classroom partnership with Columbus City Schools. In 2013, she began the role of education program manager, now the manager of public programming, and the volunteer coordinator overseeing all the center's education programs and working closely with the center's volunteers. She is passionate about working with children and having the opportunity to share the natural world with them. She knows firsthand the importance of expanding the classroom beyond four walls and positive difference. Connecting children with nature can make both academic, can, can make both academically and emotionally. So welcome, Allison. Our next uh, expert is Nicole Jackson from the Columbus Audubon. She is an alumna of the College of Food, Agriculture, and Environmental Sciences at The Ohio State University. She earned her Bachelor of Science degree in Environmental Education and Interpretation and has worked in different capacities throughout the past decade as an environmental educator, facilitator, and freelance consultant for various nonprofit organizations across Ohio. A nature enthusiast, a park advocate and birder, Nicole has always had a strong bond with nature and its beauty since she was a young girl. 
In June of 2020, Nicole, along with a small group of Black STEM professionals and students, co-organized Black Birders Week. The event was a week-long series of online events that highlighted Black nature enthusiasts and increased the visibility of Black birders who face unique challenges and dangers when engaging in outdoor activities. In 2018, she joined the Next Generation Advisory Board of the National Parks Conservation Association, and this council of diverse leaders and advocates explore effective methods of engaging younger generations in national park advocacy and protection. Nicole is new, a new board member of the Columbus Audubon and hopes to get more communities of color out to enjoy the benefits of birding in their neighborhoods. Welcome, Nicole. And our next speaker, me. Or our next, our next expert is Susan Drewby. She graduated from the Ohio State University with a Bachelor's of Science in Natural Resources and a Master of Science in Agricultural Education. She has spent more than 50 years working in environmental education in various capacities, including eight years as senior naturalist at High Bank Special Park, uh, from which she is retired. She started the beginning birding program that is held every Saturday at Grange Insurance Audubon Center. Uh, Susan's most favorite bird feeding station is outside of the main windows of the cabin in Licking County, which has been part of her family for 53 years. That's awesome. So welcome, Susan. Thank you. So let's let's just dive right into it. So uh, the first question is for, for you, Allison, and, and that is this time of year, what type of birds are we expected to see in our backyard? Well, it's an exciting time of year. I always get excited here at the center because we have a lot of um, classroom programs out here. I usually remember my first class that sees a winter bird at the river and at our feeders. So um, we're anxiously awaiting that to happen. But in terms of um, in your backyard, one of my favorite birds is the dark eyed junco, which is a type of sparrow. I personally think it's the prettiest sparrow. Um, a lot of people call these snowbirds um, because you do tend to see them when the first snow comes at your feeders. Uh, they like to feed on the ground. So obviously when the snow is there, they have to find another source. Um, I love them because they kind of have a white belly and a gray back. So the gray kind of fits in with our lovely Columbus, Ohio sky. Um, and then the snow on the ground. And they have a really unique um, little white outer feather on their uh, tail feathers. So it kind of looks like they have a stripe when they fly off. So that's an exciting one that usually comes. Um, another one that we actually saw in the park this week out in the prairie is the white crowned sparrow. Um, so that's a unique one. That's kind of an easy one to be able to spot because you can see the white crown on that. And another one that may not come to your feeder, although if you have suet out, it may come to your feeder, um, would be the brown creeper. And that's a really unique bird. It likes evergreens and deciduous trees, and it kind of moves in a spiral up a tree. Um, they're not the greatest flyers, so they'll kind of hop to another tree, start at the bottom, and then spiral up again. They're kind of hard to find, um, but then they're really rewarding when you do see them. So those are just a few. Um, of course, there's a lot of birds along the river and other um, aquatic habitats that would come in as well. But since we're talking about backyard birds today, um, I tried to stick with ones you might see at the feeder. Awesome. Uh, and then obviously, like there's some that, you know, it's a bright red bird that we see probably year round, right? And uh, Cardinal, uh, I did a presentation for a class yesterday and um, one of the things we talked about was the cardinal and how you do see them all year round, which is, and it's the state bird of Ohio. Um, yes. Susan and Nicole, I know you all have uh, probably seen a few more birds than just robins and cardinals out there. I'm sure there, there are a number of woodpeckers that'll come to your feeders. Um, chickadees are, we, we always joke that they're the first ones to come. I used to say that, that they're like preschoolers. They're very tiny. Uh, very loud and very brave, and so they're the ones that come to your feeder first. Blue jays will come, crows uh, will come. Um, what am I missing? Goldfinches. Nut hatches. Goldfinches. Yeah. That's tough to tip mice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm obsessed with the juncos. I literally first thing I think about when I think about the colder months of in Ohio are the juncos. Um, just because they're really cute and they're ground feeders, but just they're, they're, um, the colors, uh, fascinate me, uh, and they're really like just plump birds. So 
Uh, they remind me of the, the little plush toys <laughs> that kids have. <laughs> Um, but I also like the, the goldfinches just because of their plumage, how it changes um, from summer um, through the through colder months. Um, and just their flight pattern always intrigues me. So um, very bright, bubbly uh, bird. And that, that also reminds me, like we have uh, coneflowers or, you know, the dead coneflower stems that are still up. We keep them up until the springtime because the uh, local um, Local birds love to, especially the goldfishes. It's mm -hmm. like you, they're out there and you don't see them, and then you walk by and it's just like, doo -doo 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 -doo, and they all <laughs> fly away in a group. But you had mentioned uh, the juncos. What do they look like? They um, they have the gray back, dark gray back, and a white belly. They also kind of have like a um, white or light pink beak. So they're really distinctive, especially when you think of sparrows or little brown birds that people usually call them. Um, that's why I love the Junko. They are, they, they kind of have a um, cheerful little chip that they make. Um, you can often hear them. They're a little quieter than a cardinal, um, but they're definitely one of my favorites. I actually saw one this summer up in Cuyahoga National in the forest, which was very concerning to me because it's not typically here. We were further north, but um, they're definitely a sign that winter has come and it's staying for a while. And I don't know if folks can see, but Susan is the doing taco. the old school PowerPoint right yeah. there. <laughs> that is great. And, and, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm old, so less of technology is good. <laughs> <laughs> so, now, Susan, that kind of leads me to another question is uh, like, how, how do you make your yard, uh, your backyard, a bird friendly yard? Like, what are some of the things people should? Okay, well, the, the, the first thing to realize that, that, that the birds need a habitat, so they need food, water, shelter, and space, space to move around, to, you know, be able to protect themselves and so forth. And uh, so we're putting out bird seed. That's an obvious one to attract birds. If you can put some water in your backyard, that can be helpful. Uh, some people can maintain a, a fountain year round that's running. Um, but if that's not a possibility, um, and I'm terrible at taking care of a pond or a fountain, um, you can put out a can of water um, and change it every day. When it, you know, when it freezes over, try to get out there and change it again. Or, or you can get a little water heater to put in the pan to keep it from um, freezing over. And my first year uh, when I moved back, I, I grew up here in Columbus. When I moved back here, I um, had a little condo with, that was brand new. It had no trees around it. And I couldn't get birds to come to the feeder at all. Well, it was my first year owning a house, so I was always going over to Heckinger's to tell you how old I am. That was that was the store you went to to get hardware. And if you spent so many dollars worth, I gave you a free Christmas tree. So I got a Christmas tree, live one, put it up. And when I was done at the end of um, Christmas, I stuck it out in my backyard and I had not been getting any birds at all and immediately I got birds and um, because they were able to land in that tree and look around to see if it was safe before they came over to the feeder. So sometimes it, just moving a feeder um, around the corner to another spot where there, there are some trees nearby for them to come to is, is a, a beneficial, uh, it, makes, it makes you more successful. So having that habitat is obviously critical for yep. our, our bird's best friend, right? That reminds That's me right. that I wanted to mention our uh, the Green Spot Community Backyards Program, which we offer a fifty dollar rebate off of a native tree. Uh, we're doing I think we're doing that again next year, and our friends at Franklin Solar Water Conservation District they administer that program for us. So uh, if you if you have a barren backyard and you're looking for trees, and if, if you could wait. Or maybe you get a tree now and then in the back of your mind, you get another one in the springtime. Uh, there will be some resources available for that. You've mentioned water. Um, now they do make those heated bird baths. Are those okay to use as long as you're changing out the water uh, sure. daily? Yeah. Just, you know, I had people asking me this summer, what, why do they tell us to quit feeding birds? And I said, well, you know about pandemics, I'm sure. Um, birds can, can have pandemics also. So if you, Start cleaning your feeders and your water container on a, you know, at least every two weeks in the winter time. 
then you can be spreading disease. So clean it out and, and a heated water um, bird feeder is wonderful. Some of those bird baths don't last outside. So, you know, a concrete bird bath, it'll freeze and break. Um, I have used just a metal pan that I got at the tractor supply store that's actually designed for um, putting food in there for chickens to hop in and eat, you know, and it's only about this tall, it's uh, galvanized aluminum, it's cheap, it won't break, and you can buy a chicken uh, heater, a water heater that the ch chicken farmers use um, to put in it. Well, David, you, um, you had mentioned something about with the backyard program that you guys have. Um, I also want to mention just because we're in fall right now and everybody's starting to do their yard cleanup, um, that it's a really good idea to just leave the leaves. That's an important part of the habitat right now. Um, and that'll help sustain caterpillars and other insects throughout the winter. Um, so that they're available for birds in the spring, especially when they're um, having babies and fledglings. Um, and the other thing would be to leave the seeds. I know a couple of people have mentioned that already so far today, but um, that's really important as well. I know. Um, there's a lot of places that get caught up with making sure everything is winterized and ready to go for the winter, but um, those seed sources are, that's an easy way to just leave your stems and your seeds um, for birds throughout the winter as well. I, I like that you said that, uh, Allison, just it's, we get caught up in having and thinking we have to buy so much bird seed <laughs> to sustain the birds, but they're really just using their natural habitat uh, to get the food um, and nutrients that they they need. So we need to be um, thinking about the plants as well as, like you said, the leaves being an important part of, of their diet and just needing that space and um, critters uh, to have access to. And Nicole, that, you mentioned like the, the bird seed. Is there a certain kind or a certain kind that is better than other bird seed? Like if you do happen to put out uh, some bird seed? I would say um, if you're just starting out as, as a backyard birder, um, it's good to have a variety, um, especially if you're not sure what's around in your yard. Um, so the tray feeders are good to start with, um, and then you can build up from there to the hopper feeder and um, the, uh, the tube feeders. But if you want to have specific birds, you kind of have to know the specific type of um, bird seed that will attract uh, those birds. So I think of cardinals, um, they like safflower. Um, the finches, um, the thistle seed um, is good. Um, cracked corn, um, I think of the, um, the morning doves. Um, there's peanuts uh, for blue jays. Um, the, is it black striped sunflower seed? Um, you'll get a, a good variety um, of the birds. Um, smaller birds, bigger birds, um, but I think knowing that you can start small because it can be very overwhelming like i'm just going to go to the store and just buy whatever i think <laughs> the birds but i think having a little bit set out at a time versus getting buying bird seed and then putting it out, out out and then nothing really happens um i know susan mentioned that in terms of um, your experience of of that first year not having anything come in but then moving the bird feeders or if you already have some established um, and you want to try a new feeder, put the new feeder close to the ones that are already established to get some of the birds to come in. Um, but knowing that you can kind of change things around and play around with with the space that you have um, and monitor it um, throughout the weeks um, kind of gives you that um, less pressure because um, then it's it's really not the bird's fault is just more of them getting used to that space and feeling comfortable um, and being able to come to get the seed. And um, they think about those things and, and not to say that birds are like having conversations with each other, but more so like having a place to perch or having access to water or having access to trees um, for them to escape from predators. All of those things factor into um, having the bird seed available as well. No. I would say if, uh, what I usually recommend to someone who's starting out is just uh, get some black oil sunflower yeah. seed. Um, you mentioned stripe. There are two different kinds of sunflower seeds. Yeah. We usually eat the stripers, striped ones with white stripes on them. And the ones that don't have stripes are called oil, black oil or oilers, mm -hmm. and they have more um, calories per um, weight. 
So it's a little bit less work for the bird to get the seed out. It's smaller, but it's, and, and I would just start with something like that. And when you start having a little success, experiment with some other things. You're right, safflower is supposed to be great for cardinals. Um, I, I don't put corn out in the city because of the uh, less desirable animals, that, <laughs> birds that come around, but in the, in, out from the country, I do it all the time. And the, you mentioned the, the blue jays, they absolutely adore the whole peanut in the shell. Um, they, they can stuff three or four of those in their mouth before they fly off and um, they fight one another for them. Um, some people live somewhere where they don't want the mess. And um, yeah, there are some, you can get either sunflower seeds that have been already hauled, so it's just the, the kernel from the inside, or they have some, some mix in them that is um, less messy. And I would say for the woodpeckers, you, you brought that up, uh, Susan, the suet um, is definitely yeah. good to have uh, if you're wanting to attract more of the woodpecker friends. I know uh, last year, I think it was last winter, we got, uh, I think it was called a no mess blend plus or something like that. And I, I don't know if it was like fruit or something or what, like dried fruit in there. But um, man, the, the one robin was so demanding. Because we would, we would fill up the feeder or whatever, like once a day in the morning. And so you'd wake up and you'd open the door and that, that robin was right down at that spot, <laughs> chirping away. But it's kind of neat because in the summertime, we were also feeding them. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, and I don't know if it was a he or she, but they had their offspring with them and their offspring was kind of learning the ropes. So that was kind of cool to see. And then, but it did take like we have with the goldfinches, we have a goldfinch feeder. Right now I'm realizing we're probably like a goldfinch haven because we have a bunch of cone flowers and we have a feeder but it took them a while to, to find it i think you all mentioned that before where if they don't show up the first day that's okay like give yep. it a week give it two weeks and see yep. what you have um and what are some uh, nicole what are some good guidebooks um that you would recommend that people or apps really that people could either download on their phone or maybe go to the library and get some books because i know it, you could probably we could probably do this for about three hours and list out all the birds that one could see in the backyard and there would be one bird we miss or that shows up in somebody's backyard <laughs> yeah i th i think there's definitely the, the audubon there's audubon guide um as far as books um there's sibley's i have uh, peterson's um so there's definitely a variety there and then as far as the apps um there's uh, Merlin, which is a good start starter app to use if you're wanting to see what's showing up in your um, backyard or even in your neighborhood. Um, you can um, ID by um, their shape, um, as far as you know, their size, their shape, um, what they're eating, their behavior, things like that. Uh, but also you can take photos, um, you can capture their, their calls or songs um, to see what bird um, is is popping up in your your backyard so that is a very useful resource um, and it's also connected to eBird if you're interested in citizen science um, and want to uh, help scientists uh, who are researching birds um, and their migration patterns and all of that thing uh, all of those things um, if you're really wanting to connect it to more of like a science type of, of project um, and I know there's currently the project feeder watch uh, that's an example of that right now um, the, I, 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 I recommend eBird all the time, even if you're not into citizen science, because it's a way to keep track of the birds you've seen. The nice thing about it is you say, okay, I'm going to bird watch today right here in my yard. It knows where you are and it knows what's probably going to be there. And so you're going to get a list of things. And, and if you think you saw um, something really weird, it's going to say, are you sure? You know, gives you a chance to think about it. Um, the other thing that I just learned about, and all three of these, you know, the Merlin, the eBird, and BirdNet, Net, BirdNet is the other one, are from Cornell um, Lab of Ornithology. I can't quite say that today. Um, BirdNet, uh, you take it out and you can record a song. Or, or noise, and then then it analyzes it for you and tells you what's out there, and it works amazingly well. The the survey I saw said that it works ten out of ten times, um, 
And so I was walking at, at work the other day and I got it out because I wanted to play with it. And it called up this uh, white throated sparrow that was sitting in the bush. And then I was able to look out and actually see it sitting there. So I recommend those. Um, I'm involved in Project Feeder Watch, and that would be a great way for someone to get to learn birds because they send you this poster. Now, I've cut my poster up, and that's what I was showing earlier was a picture of the Junko. The um, poster I put by our window, it lists all of the birds that are likely to be seen, and there's only 20 or 25 birds that you're really likely to see at your feeder um, usually, so you can can record what you see and, and report that. And so you're doing something worthwhile, but um, what you're mostly doing is having a lot of fun. My brother and I do this at the cabin and um, we'll sit down, okay, we'll do this for 20 minutes. And two hours later, we're still sitting there <laughs> because you, you start noticing more things when you're recording what you see. And it's not, it doesn't take a scientist to know how to record. They teach you what you need to do. And I think it's good practice too to be able to just sit yeah. in one spot, um, especially because birding can be very overwhelming. But it's also once you get the hang of it, it's very fun um, and engaging, and it's a way to just practice observation um, of of wildlife that's showing up in your backyard. And I just wanted to hop in with a couple um, other guides. Definitely, all the apps are fantastic to use. Um, I do like that, that it can store everything you've seen. My dad and I kind of have a friendly competition on eBird to see who's seeing the most. He lives in Florida, so he's got the advantage, but um, <laughs> that's a try. And I add to it when I visit. Um, but you have just your, you know, pocket field guides you can also use that just kind of fold up and go in your pocket. Um, but one of my favorite guides to use, especially if you're just sitting in your house and you don't have to lug this around, is um, the Crosley guide and uh, this is Richard Crosley. I love this guide because birds are not always sitting looking to the left or the right in that one position um, and I'll just show you it's not a very good example but I don't know let me find a bird in here but this guide is really nice because it will show you um, what the bird looks like in a variety of different um, positions so flying above you and you catch a couple markings on it, or um, you know, you're looking up at it from the bottom, or from the top, or from the side. Uh, this one's just really nice because um, you know it gives you lots of different views and the different colorings and things like that. Um, oh, it's a little that. heavier, but this is my favorite. Um, if I write stuff down in my phone and just kind of make notes, then I come home and this is what I look at. So that might be a fun one too, especially um, if you find yourself trying to figure out what birds. You're seeing when they're in different positions and flying over quickly and um, flitting around. So those are a couple of good ones too. And I'm going to record, in record a plug them too. Some... Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say. I'm I was going to say. I... Oh, yeah. I think there's just a lag time. <laughs> I was going to say I use my phone to record the bird calls and sounds um, on my phone. So if you have a recording feature on your phone. Uh, that's a good way to to capture beyond just seeing them um, capture what sounds or calls or, or songs uh, the birds are making. I was going to put in a plug for something that happens at Grange Insurance Audubon Center every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock. We have a beginning birding hike. Um, and um, David mentioned that I started that we started about 8 years ago. And um, the rule is it's only an hour and a half long program. We, sometimes bird field trips can go on for three or four hours and people don't have that kind of time. And you do not have to even have a pair of binoculars to come to that. Um, the Audubon Center has binoculars to uh, share. We teach you how to use your binoculars. It's a different leader each week. It's different weather and different birds in different seasons. So you could keep coming back to that coming time and again and start learning what to look for. Um, it's we have a lot of fun. Um, the, one of the ladies last week was almost in tears because I showed her how to adjust her binoculars because she had glasses on and she was like, "Oh my gosh, this is a game changer for her." So um, you can come and ask what you think might be a stupid question. Um, they're not stupid questions unless you don't ask them. Right. Uh, so, uh, you know, come to one of our programs. 
That's right. Yeah, those I, little I, adjustments I can make a big difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if folks uh, watching on Facebook or uh, here on the webinar, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to type them into the chat or the comment section on Facebook and we'll get to them. You know, one thing, Susan, you had had that really cool guide. You said you'd cut it up, but it looked like it was laminated. And I was thinking, yes, like you could keep yes, I laminated it and and taped it all together. It's you know, it's it it worked well. And then I hung hung it up. We have a bookcase next to our bird window, and so I hung it there, so it's always there. And no matter who comes in, they can figure out what's what's yeah. available. And, and you keep a dry erase marker. Dry erase marker by there too, and just put a little check mark uh, with the birds that you see because it's one of those where, um, yeah, I think we've all met people who are like, "What? There's only like a couple of types of birds, right?" Uh, and then you're like, "Well, no, there's a few more than that." And then once you start, <laughs> you know, once you start watching, you're like, "Wow, I never even noticed." You know, uh, I'm going down here at the nine ten. This is it's not a backyard, but down the down the road here, there's a couple of bald eagles that have been nesting there for a number of years. And uh, I didn't realize it until a couple of years after they had started and somebody told me about it, even though like I'm a nature nerd and I try to keep up to date on everything, but sometimes you just can't. So it's uh, making those connections uh, and getting connected with other people who enjoy birding. It kind of gets to like what uh, Susan, you'd mentioned the, the backyard or the, the birding that you all do at the Grange Insurance Audubon Center. Uh, are there other types of uh, uh, like upcoming events or that people get involved in or learn more about uh, backyard birding? Well, what's the, big, oh, one of the, big, uh, the biggest um, and most famous birding event is the Christmas bird count. And um, that's been going on for um, 120 years. And it was started by a couple guys who always went out on Christmas day to hunt. And they said, we need to maybe come up with a different activity. So volunteers all over the United States and Canada go out sometime during that two or three week period between uh, b before Christmas and right after Christmas and count the birds. And that information was used in putting together models by National Audubon that can estimate where our populations are going um with with uh climate change and the 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 model is very accurate well i mean we're predicting obviously so we can't know 100 percent, but it seems to be a very effective model so how could anyone who doesn't really know birds get involved the the metro parks and i think alice is going to share about kids doing a bird count at uh, the audubon center uh, the Metro Parks have programs and you can go and help with that. Or you can just be brave and call up Columbus Audubon and say, where, where is a um, account I want to go? Because we need drivers. Yes. You know, you get three or four people in the car and you go different places. You could be the driver or you could be the recorder and not know one of the birds from another and still make a big um, uh, a difference in the the count for the year. You can be a bird Uber. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Su good. Susan did mention um, we're getting ready to start our 12 days of Audubon in December, and on December 11th will actually be um, we're going to do a kids Christmas bird count. Um, just invite families with um, children to come out to the center and learn a little bit about bird ID first of all. Again, how to use binoculars and different field guides um, and then head outside to see what we can see. It'll be kind of a mock um, Christmas bird count, but just to get people engaged and excited. Um, I know my dad down in Florida leads his circle or quite a few circles actually for the Audubon that he's involved with. Um, and this this winter, I actually get to go down to do that. So I need to start studying my Florida birds so I can be an effective counter in December, but um, we'll definitely be doing that um, here at the center in December if anyone's interested. We've had us with a spoon bill and a forget bird come through Ohio. So I am super excited to learn more about the, the birds that I see in other places too. So I, uh, thanks for that reminder, Allison. <laughs> yeah. um, and I did, I did just kind of want to mention too, um, 
you know, a lot of these birds that are coming here for the winter, they're coming farther south. Um, to be able to have the resources they need, but climate is having an impact on a lot of those birds. And I know, like I mentioned earlier, the dark eyed junco is one of my favorite birds. There's actually, and hopefully quite a few years moving forward, a chance that that bird may not even need to come here anymore. Um, and that can kind of be a depressing topic, honestly, but um, there are things that you can do. Get involved with the community science. Um, we started a native plant backyard challenge here at the center just to provide more pollinating plants, uh, you know, or different kinds of um, native plants in your landscape to be able to support birds as things start to change. Um, so there's a lot of ways you can actually get involved to practice conservation, um, even though. You know, looking forward, if you look at the Audubon.org, you can find all the information on there, but you can also kind of look and see maybe you have a favorite bird and you're concerned about how it may be impacted by all these changes in the environment. So um, it can be kind of a down topic, obviously, um, but it's definitely a big warning sign and a signal to us that there's things we can do um, to help support these birds so that we keep seeing them every winter when they come back. And I would add just for, for since we're doing a lot more virtually and like online, social media is a big part of finding um, groups um, and resources. So definitely Facebook. Uh, there's tons of Facebook groups, Central Ohio birding, backyard birding, all of that um, that you can look up um, to connect with others. If you want to uh, do some uh, bird watching together, ask questions about the birds that you're seeing. Uh, there's tons of, of people out there who've had um, lots of experiences and um, uh, advancing their knowledge on different types of birds, species, habitat even. Um, and Twitter, um, I use the hashtag birding, Ohio birding a lot. So sometimes, you know, stuff will pop up through just using that hashtag um, that uh, I can use to connect with others and just get some questions, basic questions answered about what I'm seeing um, in my backyard. But then there's also, I think of, um, so the, the Christmas bird count is, I think, December 14th through the 5th of July or 5th of January. Um, uh, there's the Lights Out program. So I know we didn't talk a little bit about this, but in terms of um, learning more about uh, bird strikes, the uh, bird collisions um, that might happen uh, with backyard birding. So I think having some resources to connect with, there's Lights Out Columbus, there's Lights Out Cleveland, there's a bunch um, that you can check out um, through the Audubon website. Um, and also all about uh, allaboutbirds.org um, is a great resource. So I think having those online tools uh, to supplement your learning is, is really important. So we don't always have to have the apps or the books. Uh, sometimes we can connect online as well. You kind of mentioned the, the like almost you know threats to birds. We've talked a little bit about climate change, right? And that's something too where if you're looking for ways in which you can reduce your your carbon footprint, you can check out Green Spot. We have over 50 different things that you can uh, do to be green at home. We also have a business program and a neighborhood program. But uh, you'd mentioned um, you know maybe it's turning off your lights uh, certain times a year. Uh, maybe if you have like large glass windows on your house. Maybe putting up those, uh, I, I always forget what they're called, but basically they look like, yeah, like actually, yeah. Um, Allison, do you want, what are those called? Uh, well, you can hang up silhouettes. Uh, we make them with kids sometimes just with a trash bag from home. The static will stick to the window. You can cut out different shapes um, here at the center behind me. We have our feeders over here and then we have the fritted glass. Um, the birds can't see the glass, so it just helps to break that up. I know Susan had mentioned moving, you know, kind of placing your feeders in different places. Um, you obviously want to see them through your windows, but you don't want them close to the structure of your home or your windows for any collisions and things like that. But we have fritted glass, but you can, um, there's lots of different companies that sell um, the bird, the window collision uh, kind of stickers that you can remove. Um, but then the easy solution is just, Cutting up a trash bag into different shapes and popping them on your windows. Seems like that's a great activity for if you have young children, it'd be a great activity for them, or even the app coming back a couple of conversations ago, where uh, I let you know what bird you're hearing. Uh, I can see kids really, really digging that. Um, with I'm going to jump around here, but like with the habitat, with climate change too, 
I know the city has an urban forestry master plan uh, they've adopted, which is to really increase our canopy. And uh, we, re we need residents to do that as well, because we can't do it as a city. Even if we planted every square inch of public property, you know, with a tree, we're still not going to hit our goal. So um, it's a benefit of trees, right? They attract the birds, they provide them food, provide them shelter. It also helps reduce the urban heat island effect, helps offset a little bit of climate change as well. And so I know we're kind of running out of time. I don't see any questions right now, but um, I don't know if, if uh, you all want to uh, part with any more words of wisdom, maybe like some other threats to be aware of, or uh, you mentioned the number of groups that folks can get involved with. Uh, Allison, let's start with you. Um, the only other thing that I was kind of thinking about, because we were talking about the apps so much and recording sounds and hearing sounds, um, and trying to identify the sounds, the opposite of that would be playing the sounds. So um, birders are kind of mixed on using apps to lure birds in. Um, sometimes it can stress the birds out a little bit. So I would suggest, you know, if you're inside your home bird watching out the window, um, definitely feel free to use those um, bird song apps if you want to try to you see a new bird and you want to hear what it sounds like um that would be a great thing to do inside but just be mindful outside that sometimes it can cause stress to the birds uh, i was on a bird hike this past weekend and um, one of the kids in the group had a bird app on their phone and they played a bird that was clearly not here this time of year so um that gets confusing for people but <laughs> you don't want to necessarily cause harm to the birds by either confusing them or, um, you know, just luring them in to see them a little bit closer. Yeah. You know, another um, concern, and I have it sitting right here. I'm sorry, I, sh I should have never sat next to my window because, and I don't know if you can see that, my cat has been sitting here disturbing me the whole time. Um, she has discovered birds. She's a kitten uh, about eight months old, I think just discovered birds um cats are going to kill songbirds out in your yard uh it's better not to let them out i actually own two cats and one hat he had been out when i i mean he when he came he came to me he had been out an outdoor cat and he is desperate to go outside but um that's not a good, good for the bird. So it's better to try to keep your cats inside. And what I've done for my cats, um, I got a piece of that window covering where you can see out, but they can't see in. And I hung a feeder right on the glass and they can get right up next to the, the bird. And the bird doesn't know they're there. It, it's just a wonderful entertainment for my cats. Um, and I, and I, uh, Chase got out the other night, but I, I can tell him no, he's an indoor cat now. So that is really a better life for the cat and for the birds. Somebody asked you actually asked a question, you kind of touched on it, but is a birdhouse attached to a window a bad idea? No. No, it's not. Um, no, it's, and, and it's, I, I have one at our cabin too, and it's right next to our dining room table. So you, you can sit there and eat and the birds come right up next to you. Um, there, you know, we do worry about window strike, but up, up above there, with, with the feeder right there, it interrupts the space so the bird knows there's something there. Gotcha. And what it, all it sees is the bird feeder, but there's a glass there too. Yeah, cool. And Nicole, how about you? Um, I would say, I know you were bringing up before, like not knowing like all of the birds that show up in your, your area. I, so I live in an apartment complex. I don't have a backyard, but my backyard is, uh, part of the Olin TNG trail. Um, so I use that a lot. So I think having, just giving yourself time to explore, um, to observe what's there, not even like necessarily documenting it, but, you know, spending maybe 15 um minutes uh in your backyard or in a, a nearby park to kind of see what's showing up um i i think that's a really good opportunity i was able to get a glimpse of a an eagle flying over uh the olentangy river but also there's a nesting pair of uh, cooper's hawks so not knowing that until i gave you know a little bit more time to just explore the area you never know what you're you're gonna find so 
um, really start small and, you know, whatever questions you have, I'm sure they can get answered over time. Uh, don't put too much pressure on yourself to try to know everything. Um, know a little, every bit of uh, information, um, but knowing that it's a, a lifelong learning journey uh, that you're creating for yourself. So I, I think that's definitely something um, that's important for, for kids and adults um, and even seniors to just give themselves that, that learning space uh, to tune into nature in a, in a different way. That's great. That's great. And even like, no matter where you are in the city, just like look at your surroundings and see what types of birds you birds you see. Uh, with the cat issue and the threats of cats, I know like we're crazy cat people in our households. We have a catio that's on our back porch. I'll oh, tell yeah. you how much it costs. Uh, <laughs> and then we also walk one of our cats on a heart with a harness. So even though we're yeah. that type of people in our neighborhood, uh, it, it keeps the birds a little bit safer that way. Right. But I do want right. to. Um, I think that's all the questions that I see coming in now. Um, so if you happen to tune in right now and you miss, you miss a great conversation, uh, we have recorded it and it is going to live up on the city of Columbus's YouTube page, as well as the green spot website. Uh, it'll probably, uh, be up there Friday or Monday, uh, depending on how long I can turn things around here. But I do want to thank uh, our guests, Nicole, Allison, and Susan for taking the time out of their day. Uh, to talk to us about uh, birds and uh, birding, backyard birding. All right, well, everybody, have a great evening and uh, happy birding. Thanks, David. Bye. Bye.